Hello and welcome to this video on gender and educational achievement, always an achievement, gender identity and subject choices. First we're going to look at boys and achievement. The growing gender gap in achievement has given rise to a concern that boys are falling behind within the British education system. Possible factors contributing to this include boys' poor literacy skills, the feminisation of education, the shortage of male primary school teachers and laddish subcultures. And we're going to look at all of these now. Firstly, boys and literacy. The gender gap may be the result of boys' poor literacy and language skills. We tend to find that parents spend less time reading with their sons. And of that reading undertaken by parents, most is done by the mother. And as a result, reading may appear to be feminine. So it could be that dads or fathers are failing to read with their sons and failing to show that reading can be masculine. And this might be what's turning boys off reading. Secondly, Boys' leisure pursuits, football and computer games for the most part, do not help develop language skills, which are very important in the education system. Whereas girls' leisure pursuits involve communication and relationship building, which do help to develop language skills. It's often said, for example, that girls form a bedroom culture. So girls might inv uh, invite their friends round to maybe sit around in a bedroom, read magazines, talk to each other, perhaps text other friends or surf the internet. And by doing this, they are practicing their literacy skills. Next, the decline of traditional men's jobs. So since the 1980s in the United Kingdom, there's been a big decline in heavy manufacturing, mining and steel working. These types of industries have been outsourced to places like China and India. Mitsos and Brown argue that the decline in these sectors has led to a crisis of masculinity. Whereas traditionally, perhaps boys would have grown up and gone to school knowing that one day they're going to get a job in an industry which is masculine or is seen as being masculine. Perhaps they're going to follow their father and their grandfather into a particular role. Now that those jobs and those industries have declined, Mitsos and Brown said that this has led to a crisis of masculinity, that increasingly boys don't know where they fit in the world or the types of jobs they're going to do, and that this again is turning them off education. So without a prospect of getting a job, many working class boys lose motivation to get qualifications, and this leads to low self-esteem. So whereas perhaps middle class boys may still see a route for themselves, maybe through higher education into the top jobs, things like becoming a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, and so on, um, it may be that amongst working class boys where, who would have gone into those heavy industries, those manufacturing industries and so on, could be that they now think, well, what's the point of education? It's not going to lead to anything. It's not going to get me a job. So they may just simply not engage. However, these jobs, those traditional masculine uh, manufacturing heavy lifting jobs, uh, did not require many, if any, qualifications. And as such, their disappearance probably, probably has had little impact on boys' motivation to obtain qualifications. So to be honest, it's unlikely that once upon a time, the boys were sort of turning up to school, working really hard so they can go become a miner or become a metal worker. And so that now those jobs have gone, it probably had very little impact on how hard they try at school. Next, the feminization of education. So this is looking at the work of Saul, who argued that schools do not nurture masculine traits such as competitiveness and leadership. Instead, they celebrate traits more closely associated with girls, such as attentiveness in class and methodical working. The argument here is that coursework should be replaced with a single exam. So this is the idea that coursework is all about you know, putting in extra time and effort, uh, redoing work or going over work once you've received feedback from the teacher. And these are things that perhaps girls are better at doing because they are more methodical in their work ethic than boys, whereas boys traditionally did better in single exams. And so Saul would argue here, perhaps we need to go back to the single exam because the likelihood boys would do better, whilst at the same time, we know that girls probably would continue to achieve too. And this led Saul to argue, we have challenged the 1950s patriarchy, but we have thrown the boy out with the bathwater. So he was saying here, yes, we've improved the situation and the system for girls or female students, but in doing so, we've kind of um, let the boys go or let them slip through the cracks or we've left them behind. And perhaps we need to do more now to uh, address that problem. Fourthly, the shortage of male primary school teachers. Arguably, there is a lack of strong, positive male role models at home and in school. 
1.5 million single mother families in the UK. So that means dad's not around, dad's not there to be a strong male role model for, in particular, sons to look up to. Looking at the Department from Education and Skills in 2007, they found that only 16% of primary school teachers are male. So it would appear that there's not many strong positive male role models in schools either for boys to look up to. So the absence of those role models in both the home and in the school could be problematic here. YouGov, which is an interesting company that does uh, pieces of research, and actually you can sign up to YouGov and be part of that research if that's something you're interested in, in 2007 found that 39% of 8 to 11 year old boys have no lessons with male teachers, despite many saying they concentrate better and work harder with male teachers. So it does appear there that boys would say or are saying that they would do better if they had more male teachers, but there simply are not enough of them and that's perhaps causing this issue. Finally then, laddish subcultures. This may contribute to underachievement amongst boys. Epstein found that boys harassed uh, other boys and labelled them as sissies or subjected them to homophobic abuse if they appeared to work hard. So there does seem to be an issue uh, amongst boys in school, both primary and secondary, but primarily secondary, where if boys are working hard, other boys, other male students will turn around and will verbally abuse them. Sometimes physically abuse them too, but generally verbally abuse them and use rude remarks as a way of trying to almost prevent them from working hard. Francis also found that boys are more concerned than girls about being labelled as a SWAT or a nerd or a geek or a neek. Um, the language changes regularly, but the idea of an individual is seen as being a brainy and working hard. In particular, in working class subcultures or working class culture generally, masculinity is equated with tough manual work. And it may be that academic work in school is seen as being feminised. So again, boys are turned off from engaging with it. This leads to a sort of culture of real boys don't work, and if they do, they get bullied, which is enough to probably deter many boys from working hard. Laddishness is, appears to be spreading and growing throughout the UK uh, as the years go by. Boys try to construct themselves as a non-feminine individual. So the boys are trying to create their own identity. They are setting themselves against femininity. They may see femininity as being related to academia and education. And so they are choosing almost to reject it in a, uh, with a view to trying to be masculine or trying to appear macho. And so ultimately sort of turn their backs on academia or education to show that they are masculine, which is problematic and is going to lead, lead to educational underachievement. Moving on, we're now going to look at subject choice and gender identity. Despite the improvement in girls' achievement relative to boys, there persists a fairly traditional pattern of boys subjects and girls subjects. For example, boys tend to choose maths and physics, whilst girls choose modern languages. And you may want to take a moment now just to pause the video and maybe write down all the subjects that you studied at GCSC and think about, you know, why did you choose those subjects? Were uh, they influenced those decisions uh, by your gender in any way? Were you interested in what your friends of a similar of the same gender? were doing in terms of what they were studying and were you also aware perhaps of what um, friends of other genders were studying. Schooling also reinforces gender identity both through the curriculum as well as through interactions between teachers and pupils. The introduction of the national curriculum in 1988 restricted pupil choice. Both within secondary education and post 16 However, boys and girls tend to follow what we call gender roots. So prior to the introduction of the national curriculum, there technically was more freedom for students to choose what it is they wanted to choose. We tend to define when that happened, however, is that boys were all studying what were seen as masculine or boys subjects and girls are studying more of what were seen as feminine or girl subject. With the introduction of the national curriculum, the idea was that students would more or less do the same subjects with some freedom to choose some of their subjects. And even with the implementation of the national curriculum, we still found that those decisions tended to be gendered. And by the time we get to post-16, so we're thinking about A-level and B-tech here, and obviously also ultimately uh, higher education, again, there was a gendered element here, often referred to as gender roots. So up to 16, girls choose often food technology, whereas boys choose graphics and resistant materials. So here we're thinking about DT, design and technology, and generally there are some options there um, that are available when you're at school and often boys and girls choose different things. In terms of vocational courses, only one in a hundred construction students are female. 
So let's imagine that for a moment. If you were a student uh, and you're walking into a construction course and there was a hundred students there, only one of them would be female. Now, if you're female, whilst you're listening to this, that's quite an image to imagine. But again, also if you're male, imagine being already in the room as that single female student turns up. It would be perhaps quite shocking. It would be glaringly obvious that there was a gender divide here. Whereas only nine in a hundred health public services and care students are male. So similar kind of um, game to play in our mind there. Imagine, depending on what gender you are, that you see those people come into the classroom for their first day. It would be quite shocking and obvious that there was a difference there in terms of you know the majority of the makeup of the class. In terms of explanations of gender differences in subject choice, firstly, it could be to do with early socialisation. According to Anne Oakley, a very important and influential sociologist, feminist sociologist, sex refers to physical differences between male and female, and gender refers to learned cultural differences. As sociologists, we are generally more interested in gender rather than sex, as sex refers more to biology than sociology. Gender role socialization is the process of learning behavior expected of males and females in society. So when you are born, you are essentially assigned a gender based on your sex, and then based on that gender assignment, you will then be treated a certain way by society, by your parents, but also by uh, your wider family, friends and family, and uh, also society at large. And that is the process of gender role socialization. Boys and girls are dressed differently. They are given different toys and encouraged to engage in different activities from a young age. And you may want to think about your own childhood here for a moment and the sorts of tasks and activities you engaged in, but also the toys that you were given. Boys are rewarded by parents for being active and girls for being passive. Boys are rewarded at school for being tough and showing initiative, whereas girls are supposed to be quiet, helpful and clean. If we think about the difference between boys' books and girls' books, boys' books tend to be factual and hobby-based, often books about you know, football, footballers or footballing or other sports, whereas girls' books tend to be stories about people and about relationships. Furthermore, thinking about early socialisation still, we need to think about gender domains. So tasks and activities which boys or girls see as their territory and therefore relevant, relevant to themselves, this is what we mean when we talk about gender domains. So within education, some things are seen as being male or female, and boys and girls will engage with them differently if they feel that that domain correlates with their own gender. So mending a car is seen as male territory, whilst attending to a sick child is not. Children are more confident when engaging in tasks when it falls within their domain. And, for example, maths, or in maths, girls are more confident tackling equations when explained as food or nutrition, whereas boys prefer cars. So if you think back again to when you were in primary school and you first start, started studying maths properly, sometimes in basic equations it would say things like, you know, um, if we have three apples and four bananas, that's the sort of equation that perhaps girls would be more interested in. Uh, whereas, you know, boys, if it said we had three cars and nine trucks, they'd be quite interested in that more than perhaps the nutrition-based equations. Patricia Murphy did an interesting uh, experiment where she gave children a task to design boats and vehicles and to write an estate agent's advert for a house. Boys tended to design power boats and weaponry with little living accommodation, whereas girls designed cruise ships with attention given to social and domestic details. Boys tended to design sports cars and army vehicles, whereas girls designed family cars, and often you had the family in the car waving out at the person looking at the piece of paper. The estate agents adverts, boys tended to focus on man spaces like garages and sheds, whereas girls focused on the women's sphere of the kitchen and decor. This seems to show that boys and girls pay attention to different details when tackling the same task, which may help to explain why they choose different subjects. So, once again, depending on how you've been socialised into whichever gender you have been assigned, you may approach different tasks and activities in education differently, and you may succeed or not succeed on, uh, with them, depending on whether or not you see them as being part of your gender domain. Next, thinking about gendered subject images. This is the gender image that a subject gives off. So it's often um, different subjects are seen as being male or female. So whereas science tends to be taught by men, this leads boys to monopolate the apparatus in the science labs because they may see it as being part of their domain. It may give off a male subject image. 
In terms of computing, this involves working with machines that are seen to be masculine and that there are less opportunities for group work, which tends to be something which favours women or fit favours girls, could mean again that this is seen as a male subject. In terms of gender differences in subject choice, it could be down to peer pressure. So subject choice can be influenced by peer pressure. Boys tend to opt out of dance and music for fear of attracting a negative response for their peers. Whereas sports are often considered more masculine, girls who opt to take up sport have to deal with an image which contradicts the traditional feminine stereotype, which is sporty. So some girls may really like sport, but often think, well, I don't want to be too heavily involved in sport or PE or games because I might become muscular, I may be sweaty, and these might be things that are contradictory to the traditional feminine image of someone who is quiet, polite, calm, neat, tidy, and clean. Boys consider girls butch or lesbian if they are more interested in sport than themselves. And again, this could be a turn-off for girls when it comes to studying sport. So peer pressure may play a role here. We also need to think about gendered career opportunities. So jobs tend to be sex types. That means that some jobs are seen as masculine and other jobs are seen as feminine. And ultimately, arguably, the reason for education in the first place is to prepare students for the world of work so they can go and get a job and provide for themselves in later life and if jobs are sex types that's probably going to influence perhaps the types of subjects that students choose with a view to preparing themselves for those jobs. So women's jobs often involve work similar to that performed by housewives such as childcare and nursing. Women's roles usually fall within the domains of clerical, secretarial, personal services so they may choose subjects which relate to those. And only a sixth of male workers uh, work in these industries. So it is a case that these are industries dominated by women and perhaps they're going to be choosing subjects which are going to give them the skills they need to do well in those areas. Sex type and affects perception of what jobs are possible and acceptable moulding subject choices. So young girls, but also young boys, if they do ultimately think about their future and think about, well, what do I want to be? What do I want to do when I grow up? What subjects, therefore, do I need to be able to do that? it may be playing a role, it may be moulding them. So you could be thinking here about gendered career opportunities. Next, we're going to look at gender identity more generally. So how do people's experiences in school reinforce their gender and sexual identities is the question here. And we need to think about verbal abuse, male peer groups, teachers and discipline, the male gaze and double standards. Bob Connell argued that all of these experiences could lead to the creation of a hegemonic masculinity. So here we're focusing on boys for a moment. In terms of hegemonic masculinity, we're talking here about the dominance of heterosexual masculine identity and the subordination of female and gay identities. So it could be that the way education operates may reinforce a very traditional macho form of masculinity and it may socialise boys into it and they may want to try and prove that they have this type of identity and they work towards showing that they do and in doing so they may subordinate or undermine female and gay identities. A rich vocabulary of abuse is one way in which gender and sexual identities are reinforced by students Boys use name calling to put down girls if they act or dress in certain ways, so they may refer to them as butch. Boys call girls slags or sluts if they appear to be sexually available and frigid if they don't or didn't. The use of negative labels such as gay, queer and faggot are ways in which students police each other's sexuality. And some boys are labelled as gay simply for talking to girls or being friendly with female teachers. So what we have here are some examples of the different types of language of verbal abuse terms which are used by students to essentially regulate, monitor other students' gender and sexual identities. And it's a way almost of trying to keep people on that straight and narrow, keep everyone within the kind of defined boundaries of who can do what, when and where. And there is an expectation that people will be firstly straight or heterosexual, uh, but also that they will adhere to traditional masculine or feminine ways of behaving. And if someone doesn't do that, other students will use this verbal abuse, this language, this terminology, almost to police each other's gender and sexual identities and to reinforce these traditional models. These terms often have no connection with a boy's actual sexual orientation, 
or girl sexual sexual orientation for the matter but it's simply a way of reinforcer reinforcing gender norms next we need to consider male peer groups male peer groups use verbal abuse especially in anti-school subcultures and boys which do well often labeled as gay or they may use some of that other terminology from the previous slide here we need to consider the role of social class because there are some differences between the working and middle classes so macho working class lads often criticize or abuse working class boys who work hard and aspire to middle class careers calling them perhaps more contemporarily neeks or perhaps previously dickhead achievers or perhaps even prior to that e-rolls thinking back to the work of paul willis Whereas for middle class boys, often they try to appear to be effortlessly achieving, working hard on the quiet. That means at home they might be doing extra study or working particularly hard with a view to making sure that when they're in lessons, they can just naturally effortlessly achieve or get top grades without appearing to working too hard in those lessons. Next, we need to think about the male gaze. And this is the visual aspect of how pupils control each other's identities. And in particular, we're thinking about how male pupils and teachers look at female pupils and teachers. So male pupils and teachers look girls up and down, seeing them as sexual objects, making judgments about their appearance. This is actually a form of surveillance. It's a way of you know, watching and monitoring and scrutinizing girls or women um, and measuring them against their sexual availability. This helps to reinforce heterosexual masculinity and devalue femininity. We see this in the way in which boys tell and retell stories of sexual conquests or supposed sexual conquests, and those who don't are often labelled as gay or they're ostracised from their group of friends. So this is a way in which boys and men may seek to try and control women and their sexuality by looking at them, by judging them, by making comments uh, about them and there is a sort of you know very much a negative sexist misogynistic element to this and this is something that feminists in particular would be particularly particularly concerned about next we need to think about teachers and discipline and here we're thinking about the work of Haywood and Mac and Gale they found that male teachers tell off boys for acting like girls and tease them when they score lower than girls on tests Teachers tend to ignore boys verbal abusing girls and tell girls off, in fact, for attracting it or bringing it upon themselves. Male teachers are often protective of female staff, rescuing them from disruptive classes, but in doing so, they actually undermine the teacher, making them look as if they cannot cope. Finally, we need to think about double standards. So double standards in sexual morality exist, whereas... If boys boast about their sexual exploits, uh, that's seen as a positive thing, whereas they often call girls a slag or a slut if he does the same, or she does not have a steady boyfriend or dresses or acts, acts in a certain way. A feminist would say that this is an example of our patriarchal society justifying male power and devaluing women. So by a double standard here, we're talking about applying one moral standard to one group and applying a different moral standard to another. So again, if boys are seen to be sexually active, that's often seen as a positive thing, or at very least amongst themselves as a peer group, whereas girls are seen as being sexually active by other boys, that's often seen as a negative thing, by other girls, that's often seen as a negative thing. And we could argue that a wider society, often they are very concerned about the sexual activities of girls rather than boys. So it does appear that we have in our society a double standard which is being reinforced by the education system, or at the very least, it's not being challenged by it. That's it. Thank you very much.